One of the most important events in South African history is something that historians refer to as the Mineral Revolution. Why exactly the discovery of diamonds in 1867 and the discovery of gold in 1886 is referred to as a revolution is the focus of this video. This video looks at how did the discovery of these two minerals revolutionize the region of Southern Africa and in fact lead to the development of the country of South Africa. What the mineral revolution is, it's the impact or the consequences that these mineral discoveries had on shaping the region and had many different consequences. It led to the unification of various different territories into one South Africa. It led to the industrialization of the region. It involved, attracted foreign investment. It led to colonial conquest, or there was already colonial conquest, but it took it a step further and a lot of people lost their land as a consequence of this. It also shaped modern South Africa, leading to the inequality and the history of racial division that we see today. But why was this the case and how exactly did this happen? That's what we look at in this video. Now, before we start, what exactly is the mineral revolution? A commonly used definition of mineral revolution, the development of the region from a patchwork of agrarian states into a unified industrial state following the discovery of two important minerals, diamonds and gold. That tells you exactly what the mineral revolution was. The transformation of the region of Southern Africa from a collection of agricultural or farming, subsistence farming states or regions into one unified industrial state as a consequence of two very valuable minerals, diamonds and gold. Now, if you were to go back in time to 1860, which is seven years before the diamond discoveries, there was no country called South Africa. Instead, the region of Southern Africa was made up of various different territories. There were still, at this stage, independent African kingdoms, like the Zulus, the Pedi, the Xhosa had colonial inroads, but they were still somewhat independent. The frontier wars had been taking place, so not all groups of the Xhosa had been conquered yet. There were also some hybrid societies or mixed race societies, like the Greek ones, Greek or West, the Greek or East, who were descendants of Khoi Khoi and slaves who were imported to the Dutch Cape Colony. And you had these four European colonies. So the first European colony now. In other videos, we've spoken about how the scramble for Africa took place during the 1880s. But there were some exceptions, and one of those exceptions was South Africa, where colonial inroads took place much earlier. As early as 1652, the Dutch had established what began as a refreshment station, but grew into a colony, became known as the Dutch Cape Colony. Due to strategic reasons, the British decided to come in, take over that colony, came in 1795, left and came back in the early 1800s. And then, the, as a consequence of British rule, some of the now not exclusively Dutch, but Dutch, German, and French inhabitants of the Cape went to the interior and established what they called Boer Republics. So by this stage in South Africa history, be just before the discovery of diamonds and gold, the region consisted of a collection of European and African societies or territories two European, the British Cape Colony and the British Natal Colony, two uh, Boer or Afrikaner Republics, the Orange Free State and the South African Republic, which later became known as the Transvaal, and a number of independent African societies. But diamonds are going to be discovered and everything's going to change. This patchwork of agrarian states wasn't really a concern to the British Empire as such. They regarded South African colonies as colonial backwaters, wasn't their most important colonies. In fact, some British officials regarded it as their least most important colonies. They had only colonized the Cape and Natal for strategic reasons, to safeguard their colonies in the East. But once diamonds are discovered, they're going to really change their interest. So in 1867, diamonds were discovered where the Vaal and Orange Rivers meet. So in what was rural farmland, the disputed territory we'll get to just now, there was a town called Hope Town, and farming farm surrounding that, there was a farm called the Skulk. And the, the Skulk farm uh, was owned by the Daniel Jacobs, the Jacobs family. And in 1866, young boy Erasmus Jacobs was playing, well, he collected a stone, or what he thought was a stone, to play with his sister. His sister and him would play uh, a game of called Five Stones, and 
they would do this. Now, the former owner of the farm, Scott Van Yeken, who also was their neighbor, he owned a larger farm, sold it to the Jacobs family, and he was visiting them. He saw the two kids, Louisa and Erasmus Jacobs, playing with this shiny stone. And he realized that that's not a stone, that's a diamond. Now, something important to note as well is that even though we say diamonds were discovered in 1867, it's very unlikely that this was the first diamond discoveries. The indigenous people, in this instance, the Swana, there's mentioned that they would go along the river in search for diamonds, which they use for rituals and other things. So Scott Panikin might have heard that there are diamonds in this region. So when he saw that stone, it attracted his suspicion. He spoke to the mother of Erasmus Jacobs, and she said, yeah, he can take the stone. He said, no, he promises it's, it's, if it's a diamond, he will share the profits with the family. It turned out to be a diamond. This didn't immediately attract a diamond rush to the region because most of the geologists or the experts said that South Africa's is not a place, the experts said, it's impossible, this is not a place you can find diamonds. They didn't really have a good understanding of the South African landscape or of how diamonds are produced and transported to the Earth's surface. So they were incorrect. And there would be prospectors beginning to search for diamonds. Now, the diamonds don't actually originate where Erasmus Jacobs picked up the stone. It was washed down by the river. Further north, what is today Kimberley, is where these diamonds have originated. Deep down the Earth's surface, there are these extinct volcanic pipes which have transported during when there was a volcanic explosion, transported diamonds from the Earth's crust closer to the surface. And as time goes on, sometimes some of those diamonds are washed down the river. Now, there's going to be a little bit of attraction eventually. But Nikon is going to buy a diamond from a Greek or farm worker. He's going to pay him 500 sheep, 10 oxen, and a horse in exchange for this diamond. And this will attract a lot of people. And they will eventually discover these volcanic pipes further north. And that will initiate a huge boom. The city of Kimberley will emerge. Thousands will flock in because search for diamonds make wealth. There's no houses to accommodate them. There's no schools. There's no infrastructure. There's no food. So other people began to specialize in providing these services and a town and development starts to happen in what was once farmland. But the bigger discovery is going to happen a little later on. In 1886, large bear, uh, gold bearing reefs were discovered in the Transvaal. Now, again, gold was not discovered in 1886. There were a few other areas in South Africa just before this 1886 period where there were smaller discoveries of gold. But in fact, if you go back 800 years ago, Kingdom of Mapungubwe, the people of Southern Africa had been producing gold for a very, very long time, mining gold. Tulamela and Mapungubwe are examples of African societies that were producing gold. But from the colonial perspective, this period is very important. Now there were, after the diamond discoveries, some smaller discoveries of gold. But the big diamond bearing reefs discovered by George Harrison would happen in 1886. And this would be a huge vast amount of gold, but also um, you think of it as a high quantity but low quality because little fragments of gold distribute deep over a very long period. You need a lot of capital investment in order to mine that gold. So these two mineral discoveries together will be what will be the mineral revolution. And it's going to have consequences which are going to completely shape and alter the situation in Southern Africa, which is the focus of this video. Led to massive industrialization impacting the social political and economic fate of the region, which we'll get to now. It had many implications. It led to, prior to the Minna Revolution, principal means of trade was barter. There was not a lot of foreign investment. There was not a lot of wealth. Most people in South Africa grew their own uh, food, uh, made their own clothes, etc. Traded barter. If I have apples, and you have something, then I give you this, you give me that. But now there's going to be a form of currency introduced. There's going to be foreign investment going to be a lot of wealth to be made by certain people, but it's also going to lead to a lot of people losing their land. It's going to lead to, a, due to a sequence of events, division of labor along racial lines. It's going to lead to massive inequality, and it's going to lead to industrialization. Also important to note is that these mineral discoveries took place in a period of African history referred to as the Scramble for Africa. 
in the African continent had been visited by Europeans as far back as the 1500s. But it's only in the 1880s where most of the continent, about between 80 and 90 percent of the continent, became colonized. And there were a number of reasons for this, one of which was these mineral discoveries. When diamonds and gold are discovered in Southern Africa, Britain starts to the region changes. Whereas prior they had the Cape Colony and the Natal Colony, which were alongside independent groups of Africans, wasn't a concern to them. But now you can see certain individuals with the British Empire are going to be pushing for harder colonialism, unify the region, don't fall behind on the race for colonies in Africa. In order to understand the impact of these mineral discoveries and again how it revolutionized the region, it's important to understand what the region was like before the mineral discoveries. And hence, looking at a couple of maps will give a bit of context. Now, no, no map is perfect. A map like this gives you a general idea of what Southern Africa looked like before the mineral revolution. But it's not 100% accurate because it doesn't account for all the independent groups of Africans who are still within the region. But it does give you a little bit of understanding. If you look at this map, you can see the Cape Colony, the British Cape Colony. By this stage, you know, the Dutch had established this colony in 1652. It began as a very small colony over here. Now in South Africa, the long before the arrival of Europeans, the original inhabitants of the region are a group of hunter-gatherers referred to as the San. Gradually, as Bantu-speaking people, farming people began to migrate, they introduced animals. Some sand ado uh, adopted the practice of pastoralism, and we call them the Khoi Khoi. They were generally distributed throughout the western region of South Africa, where the climate is a lot drier, and Bantu-speaking people who migrated to the, over that, at least 2,000 years ago, were found in South Africa, had conquered more of the eastern parts of the country where rainfall is higher. Since they are farming people, it's better for their cultivation of their crops. So you have various groups, you know, the Sutuswana, Tosa, and the Zulu, who together make up the Nguni, distributed throughout this region of Southern Africa. When the Dutch had arrived in 1652, they had established a coast, uh, sorry, a colony here at the Cape. And over from 1652, to the end of the 70 or the end of the 1600s, beginning of the 1700s, up until the end of the 1700s, they had expanded and slowly the San and Kwai Kwai would be displaced, either had to migrate away from the Cape or get conquered and eventually end up losing their livelihood working for the Dutch. Then the British arrived, took the colony, and when the British had arrived, they introduced a number of changes. So they came in 1795. They left, they came because of the wars with Napoleon. The French Revolution had taken place in Europe, completely altered the European landscape, but it's going to have implications for South Africa. Because after the French Revolution, various European countries tried to gang up on France. Amazing general, Napoleon would emerge. He would reverse the trend, conquer various European countries, including the Netherlands, created the Batavian Republic, kind of colonized the Netherlands. And Britain was afraid that he might come to South Africa and do the same thing. Well, the French will colonize South Africa. And if the French, who are Britain's enemy, have access to South Africa, they can cut off Britain's access to its other colonies like India, the Far East. So it was of strategic importance for them to take the colony, 1795. But they made a temporary peace with France, Treaty of Amens. They gave the colony back. But then they went to war back, so they came back for a second time. When they came back for a second time, they decided to make it a permanent British colony. I will, in another video, go into more detail with some of the things they did that upset the original uh, Dutch inhabitants. I won't say original, but the, the Dutch who had established a colony here. By this stage, they made up of Dutch, German, French Huguenots. Another story for another day. But they had to come accustomed to a lifestyle when the British arrived, treated all groups, irrespective of race, equal before the law, gave all groups the right to vote, a bit more complicated than that, but they also, uh, in terms of there were property rights and things in order to be allowed to vote. But theoretically, there was no discrimination based on racial grounds. They abolished slavery. They didn't give adequate financial compensation to the former owners of the slaves. So due to a variety of reasons, about one-tenth of the Boer, we'll call them, uh, population of the Cape decided to leave British rule and they went into these great treks. 
and they originally established a colony called Natal, but then the Republic of Natalia, but the British had decided they, they're going to take that for strategic reasons once again, the port of Durban. So the Dutch had established the Orange Free State South African Republic. The Zulus were still independent. Uh, the Greek was a mixed race society of former slaves from the who left the Dutch Cape Colony, intermarried with Kwai Kwai, formed these hybrid populations distributed over here. And this is what South, South Africa looked like before the mineral discoveries. From the British perspective, not very important. None of these regions are particularly rich. You know, most of the African societies are self-sufficient. They support themselves, they grow their own crops. The European colonies are not wealthy. The Cape and Natal are amongst Britain's least wealthy colonies. The Orange Free State and the Transvaal with the South African Republic are on the verge of bankruptcy. And the diamonds are gonna be discovered. It's gonna completely change everything. Okay, so the diamond discovery, the one that is going to initiate this mineral revolution, would happen in 1867. In December 1866, a boy named Erasmus Stephanus Jacobs found a shiny stone near the meeting point of the Vaal and Hart rivers in a place where, on farmland near a town, the closest town is a little town called Hopetown. At this point in time, a uh, very poor area, rural farmers, not a lot of wealth, not a lot of importance, etc. So this boy was believed to have discovered the stone in, 18, in 1866. The following year, Scott Van Nieken, the former owner of that farm, visits the Jacobs family, Daniel Jacobs' father, sees Erasmus and Louisa Jacobs playing with the stone, would have probably been familiar with Swana who have been using diamonds for ritual practices, so might have understood that there might be some mineral potential here, believes that stone is a diamond, asks the Jacobs family if he can take it, get it tested, gives it to a uh, trader, Bill O'Reilly, he goes to Hopetown, gets it tested, turns out the stone was eventually found to be a 21 and a quarter carat diamond. It was eventually sold for 500 pounds, known as the Eureka Diamond or I Found It Diamond. Um, this doesn't immediately spark this kind of flock or rush to the region just yet. Experts say it's a fluke. Uh, you're not going to find more diamonds. This region's uh, topography is just not suited for diamonds, etc., etc. This time, diamonds that were discovered, like in India, very different procedure in how diamonds were discovered. So they didn't understand that there's these ancient volcanic pipes beneath the Earth's surface, which would be transporting the diamonds up to what is today Kimberley, and the rivers were responsible for sometimes washing one of these diamonds, uh, which works its way all the way further south to Hopetown. But soon other diamonds are going to be discovered nearby. Eventually, Skar Panieke is going to find a Greek war farm worker with a large diamond, and he's going to make a deal with that worker. That he'll give him 500 sheep, 10 oxen, and a horse in exchange for the diamond. The, that farm worker agrees, he takes the diamond, eventually it's be discovered to be the star of Africa. And this is going to initiate this huge boom to the region. Now the main discoveries are going to come. As I said earlier, the actual diamonds did not originate in Hopetown, but they originated further north. And there were particularly three large pipes, under which were ancient volcanoes which had exploded. And now these pipes uh, extending down the Earth's crust is where these diamonds are found. When these volcanoes exploded, they blew up the diamonds towards the surface. They are found in what is today Kimberley. Now, three particular farms, Bullfontein, uh, Foretzika, and Dutoitspan would be the three farms that these diamonds are going to be discovered. But Foretzika, which means foresight, what would eventually, when the diamonds are discovered, is going to be known called Coldsburg Copy, is where the bulk of the diamonds are going to be discovered. And these prospectors flock to the region to search for these diamonds. So they go to these three areas and they start digging. The Colesburg Copy mine, where the bulk of the diamonds are going to be found, is owned by two brothers named De Beers. And later on, when Cecil John Rhodes will uh, create a monopoly, buy off all the other diamond miners and create his company, he will name it after the owners of this farm, the De Beers. They actually would sell their farm at this stage uh, and not actually play a significant role in the mineral revolution. But their name would lend itself to this big company that would monopolize the diamond mining industry. 
anyway, the area which is for Reitzika and Dutoitspan and Bulpentein, a lot of Afrikaner names. At this point in time, Britain are going to start. We'll get to how Britain uh, take control over the diamond um, re uh, producing regions. They will decide, or the Earl of Kimberley, he would, this British colonial secretary, he will decide that these Afrikaner names are not suited and he would find a one a more British name and hence since he's the Earl of Kimberley they would, the town would be named after him and will be called Kimberley. Um, people are now going to flock to this region in large numbers and it's going to completely alter the region. Now at this early stage what is known as uh, minus democracy is how they had kind of ordered themselves, they divided the land into uh, various claims, so about 30 cape feet by 30 cape feet, which is about uh, nine and a half meters by nine and a half meters, they would, a uh, person could come buy a claim, and if they buy that piece of uh, land, they would have access to whatever they discover in it. So if they would dig, if they're lucky, they'd find diamonds, they make a lot of money, if they're unlucky, uh, to avoid bankruptcy, they'll sell their claim to someone else and hopefully that person will buy diamonds. Now the situation is very problematic because they're buying these 10 by 10 claims over this area, but to get to your claim, if, you're, if it's deeper in the area, they have to make these narrow pathways. So you're going to have to walk on this narrow pathway to get to your claim. Some people start digging deeper uh, than other people. It's going to lead to a whole lot of chaos. Now this situation and the control of the diamond fields is quite problematic from a British imperialist perspective. Those who are proponents of British Empire do not like a situation like this. Now the actual land where these diamonds are discovered is disputed territory, claimed by various groups. Prior to diamond discoveries when it was just rural areas, they were actually drawing up the rigid borders and actually exactly who owns what was of no real concern because the land wasn't that particularly valuable, so various groups were occupying it. But now that the region has wealth, it's very important who exactly owns it, and various groups claim to own the region. So the land in which the diamonds were discovered were claimed by various groups. It was occupied by 3,000 Griquas. Now, the Griquas were a group of nomadic people on horseback, armed with guns, former inhabitants of the Cape Colony, former slaves who were imported to the Dutch Cape Colony, who had intermarried with Kwai Kwai and San, formed this mixed race society called the Griquas, who had migrated away from the Cape Colony. You also had groups of Kwai Kwai who were living in the region. You also had groups of Swana, the Holong, and the Batlapi. And there were also Boers with African and colored workers who all lived in this region. Now, but who exactly owns the region? The region was claimed by the Orange Free State and the South African Republic for some reason, but it was also claimed by the Griquas under their leader, Andreas Waterboer. Now, the British had in prior years made various treaties with various groups, and in 1834, they signed a treaty with Andreas Waterboer, which recognized his rule over the region. But in 1854, they had also made a, signed a treaty with the Orange Free State, which recognized their rule over the region. Now, in fact, both the De Beers family and the Jacobs family had their title deeds registered with the Orange Free State. So they felt that this region belongs to them. So it becomes quite controversial. So the British, who are making no direct claims to the region, decide that they are impartial. And they get the Lieutenant Governor of Natal, far away again, making no claims to mediate. And he looks through the evidence and he awards the territory to the Greek ones development of Kimberley. In 1871, Robert Keat granted the land to the Griquas. But it's a bit more complicated than this. They will award the land to the Griquas, but then annex it immediately on grounds that they need to protect the Griquas against the Orange Free State. The same year, the British annexed the region, claiming protection for the Griquas against the Boers. And in fact, the Orange Free State would continually dispute the granting of the region to the Greek was year after year. The year eventually the British will just agree to pay them 90,000 pounds compensation. Named after Kimberley after the British colonial secretary, it attracted a population of 30,000 in a very short period. So it's quite remarkable. But what was once just sparsely populated farmland is now attracting 30,000 people. 
people flocked to the region came from a variety of places. Uh, the Fengu, colleagues from the Cape Colony, migrants from Lesotho to pay taxes, the Peri, the Indabella, and the Lozi to purchase firearms. So various groups of Africans would travel very, very far to come to Kimberley so that they can work on the mines and or work for diggers who would pay them in a currency that they can then use to buy guns so that they can then go back home and defend themselves against other colonial inroads like the Indabella, for example, who would send their migrants all the way to uh, the diamond mines. There were also instances like in the Sutu to pay taxes, taxation, you have to work for whites to uh, earn white money to pay taxation. So there were also various groups of whites who came to the region, especially at this point in time, the Boer republics are virtually bankrupt, so a lot of them come to the come to Kimberley hoping that they could strike it rich and make a lot of money. Whites also came from overseas in areas such as the United States, Great Britain and Australia. At first, miners were both black and whites. However, with more capital and backing from the British government, whites would have an advantage. Alluvial diamonds could be extracted from the surface with a bucket and spade, but later deep level mining needed. Okay, it's quite a lot to unpack here. Originally, as many as 2,000 claimants, so you could buy a claim. So the region gets divided into these 9.5 by 9.5 by meter squares. Between each person's claims is a narrow walkway which you can use to access your claims. And at the beginning, people start mining alluvial diamonds. Alluvial diamonds close to the Earth's surface, pretty simple. You dig with the bucket and the spade, you find alluvial diamonds, you may, you're lucky you make money. But as time goes on, the situation becomes more and more problematic. Also, at this early stage, anyone could buy a claim irrespective of race, but gradually white miners start putting pressure on the colonial authorities. They start complaining. They, obviously, you, don't, you want as few competitors as you can get, and they start accusing non-white miners of diamond theft, and they put pressure on the colonial authorities to do something. Whites concerned with competition from non-whites complained about diamond theft. So Henry Barclay, the governor of the Cape issued a proclamation that a magistrate had to certify that the miner was of a good character. Now the British Cape government at this point in time is supposed to promote British liberalism, it's not supposed to be racialistic, etc. So they, to deal with this pressure that they're getting put on them from white diggers, they issue a proclamation that you, a magistrate has to declare you of a good character in order to be allowed to mine but uh, to be a diamond miner as opposed to a diamond worker. So to be the one who owns the, the claim. But obviously that gets used as a ruse to just hide racism. So the magistrate has the potential to deny non-whites the right to be a mine owner or to buy a claim. And hence they have to be the cheap labor force that's actually going to do the digging for the claimants. But even eventually most of these white claimants will also be driven out because at the beginning, when you're mining alluvial diamonds, it's pretty straightforward. You can go and you can dig. But as you start digging deeper and deeper, you need machinery. It's not possible to go with the bucket and spade and dig. Also, these narrow walkways, which people are using to get their claims, are beginning to fall. People are beginning to dig. The situation is problematic. Another problem is that the price of diamonds starts going down because the market gets saturated. I'm going to simplify this, but imagine you've got a whole lot of people digging for diamonds, producing diamonds. They start selling their diamonds. They start competing with one another. It naturally brings the price down. If I have a diamond and you have a diamond and you want to sell your diamond for a higher price, but I'm willing to sell it lower, then you have to sell yours lower in order to compete with me. And the price is being driven down. And certain individuals are beginning to realize that the situation is not adequate and they want to monopolize the industry. And the one who will become the individual that monopolizes the, re the industry will be someone named Cecil John Rhodes, who I uh, won't go into too much detail with Cecil John Rhodes, but basically he was born in England, son of a priest. Age 17, he came to South Africa to work on his brother's cotton farm. The reasons why he came, generally he had bad health and he, at the time, doctors diagnosed him with a weak lung. Uh, today we understand that he had a condition kind of like a hole in the heart which was actually responsible for his death but at the time they diagnosed him with a weak lung and under the doctor's suggestion the climate in Natal where his brother owned a cotton farm would be 
better suited for his weak lung and hence he came to Natal to work on his brother's cotton farm but when he arrived the farm was going bankrupt so he ended up uh, his brother ended up leaving the farm and when he, this coincided with this whole diamond boom in Kimberley went there to strike a rich he went along, along with his brother a uh, common story is that he went as a penniless self-made man reality he had an enormous amount of money from his aunt who gave them him the money when he arrived in South Africa and so he didn't exactly arrive penniless he arrived by you know today's money like a quarter of a million pounds uh, a lot of money so he went to the diamond uh, mining industry with others there were a number of competitors long story eventually him and his biggest rival Barney Venato would both be buying off other claimants establishing a company which can control the kind of diamond mining industry eventually he would get to strike a deal with the Rothschilds raise an enormous amount of money buy off Barney Bernato and monopolize this diamond mining industry create the Beers mine named after the De Beers fam uh, brothers who owned the farm on which the Kimberley mine would be discovered and he would now have control or monopoly over the diamond mining industry okay now this section was of conquest is a lot more complicated than i'm going to make it out to be i'm just going to simplify this uh, in a very hopefully easier to understand way it is a bit more complicated than this but basically if you look at the discovery of diamonds and then you look at a chronology of wars in south africa you'll notice that after the discovery of diamonds the british went to war with a number of independent groups of africans put an end to the independence and ultimately you would eventually between 1889 to 1902 have the second anglo-boer war between the british and the uh, two boer republics which will culminate in the formation of south africa but why are the british going to wars with these different groups of independent Africans. Now, certain individuals, certain proponents of British Empire, like in fact, like Cecil John Rhodes himself, he started off making his money on the diamond industry. As he accumulated more wealth, he went back to England, studied at Oxford, came back to South Africa, and merged capitalism with imperialism and tried to push British imperialism in South Africa, got involved in Cape politics try to pass laws like the Glenn Gray Act and various other laws to induce the country's African population to work on the mines. So to generalize, you could kind of say that if you have the situation where you've got these European colonies and African societies and the African societies are still independent, there's no reason for them to leave their farms back at home, travel to mines, work for low wages and go back home. But if you conquer them and force taxation upon them and then they have to pay a tax, use indirect rule. So, for example, the Zulu kingdom, when it got conquered as a consequence of this mineral revolution, it was divided into 13 different units with a British appointed chief who would be in charge of taxation. Then the young men, in order to pay that taxation, would have to leave, go work in the mines, earn the money, accept whatever wages they can, return back home to pay the tax. So the mineral revolution is also part of this colonial conquest now in 1877 okay so the petty and the boers went to war now the transvaal republic is this is just before gold is discovered it is bankrupt not a lot of money they're fighting two wars at the same time they're losing a lot of border skirmishes with the zulus in the south and they get defeated by Sekukuni and the petty in the north now, Britain at this point in time recognizes the wealth that could be created by having unifying the region. And Lord Carnarvon, the colonial secretary in Canada, had confederated various schemes brought about the Confederation of Canada, believed a similar policy might work in South Africa, sent Sir Henry Barclay Freer to bring this about. He identifies a number of problems. He regards the Transvaal Republic and the Orange Free State and the Zulu Kingdom. These are obstacles to British control of the region so they start trying to annex or conquer territories in 1877 the British annex the Transvaal relatively easy the Rafael Shepson marches to the Transvaal with a number of police and they basically annex and the Transvaal voluntarily accepts being annexed by the British the reason for this is because they're fighting a war with 
for they just lost a war with the Pedi, and they're fighting wars with the Zulu. So to fight a war with the British as well is simply not practical. However, once they're annexed by the British, the British will then defeat the Pedi, conquer them, then defeat the Zulu, and then immediately after, the Transvaal will rebel against the British, get back their independence. Uh, there was also the Ninth Frontier War between the British and the Tosa between 1877 and 1878. Final end of Tosa independence, conquered most of that region. Now, defeat, as I say, defeated the Pedi in 1879 and the Zulus in 1879, and the Boers would eventually get back their independence. So, Various groups are losing their independence as a consequence of the Spanish Revolution. The Greek Wars were obviously the first when um, the British had originally signed a deal with Andreas Waterboer. By the time in which the diamonds were discovered, his son Nicholas Waterboer was ruling over the territory. The British, claiming to be impartial, granted the land to him, but then annexed him, uh, well, annexed the territory under the pretext of protecting it against the Boers. But then very soon, the Greek was lost their independence, we used for forced labor, Nicholas Waterboer and some Greek was tried to rebel against British rule. They were crushed. British went to war with various groups of Africans. They would eventually lose their independence and various laws would be passed during the Smyrna Revolution designed to put an end to the self-sufficiency of African people so that they will be more likely to work for Europeans on the mines or tax them so that they would have to pay the tax, leave their homes, go to the mines, return home, pay the tax. It's an effective way of getting cheap labor, which would help to make the mines profitable. Individuals like Cecil John Rhodes had this dream. Um, during his early years in the mining industry, he began to look at South Africa. Hopefully, he wanted to work with the Boers and use Africans as a low paced labor force to be able to really extract the region's mineral resources. Gold discoveries is going to exasperate all these issues. In 1871, an English immigrant named Edward Button discovered gold on the slopes of the eastern Transvaal. After this, more loose deposits of gold were discovered in the area, it led to the creation of towns of Pilgrim's Rest and Barberton. The surface gold could be extracted using spades, but it eventually left, ran out. So there are little deposits of gold that have been discovered in various places. Now, one of the consequences of the Mineral Revolution is that it leads to the establishment of towns. Whenever a, um, a mineral is discovered, like diamonds in Kimberley, for example, the city of Kimberley emerges, what, what was once farmland. Lots of people flock to provide services, or people flock to strike it rich by mining. Other people come and to try to provide services. Subsistence agriculture transforms to commercial agriculture because people who live in the new city that's being created don't have time to sort out their own farms, so others specialize in producing it. So towns such as Pilgrim Dress and Barberton also emerge. But the main one, the largest city in, this, in South Africa, which is going to emerge now, Johannesburg, will emerge in what was once farmland. But it will become the largest city because of the importance of gold. The main discovery came in 1886 when gold-bearing rocks were found on the farm Langlata, soon to become Johannesburg by George Harrison and George Walker. So George Harrison discovered the gold bearing reef. He sold his claim and it kind of disappears from the historical record. These gold fields were large, 65 kilometers long and very deep, up to one kilometer below the Earth's surface. Now, this is a very large accumulation of gold, largest anywhere discovered in the world. But the gold is not a nice big chunks that you can just dig with the bucket and the spade and access the gold and make wealth. It's tiny little fragments over vast amounts of rock. So this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be a situation with the, in the diamond um, business where people originally bought a claim, dug the diamonds. Here, from the beginning, it's going to have to be monopolized. Well, it's going to have to be dominated by people who have a lot of capital. Because in order to extract this gold, tiny fragments of gold in large chunks of rock. You need money to buy import machinery, get skilled, experienced miners from overseas, build mines, and you also need low cost labor. So it's gonna be it's gonna be quite different from the start. Whereas with Kimberley, ordinary people began eventually companies took over as surface or alluvial mining 
transform this to deep level mining. In Johannesburg, it was like that from the start. And this gold is being discovered in the Transvaal, a Boer Republic. And to generalize, you can think of it as being both anti-British and anti-African. They have their Boer Republic. They established it by leaving the British. They don't want a lot of outsiders coming and settling in the region. They want to keep the British out particularly. They don't give voting rights to non-whites as well. But it's bankrupt. And the government realizes that this gold is its way out of bankruptcy. But it doesn't have the capacity to, to make use of this gold because it's, you need people with capital. The people with capital are those that made the money in the diamond industry in Kimberley. A lot of the people who Cecil John Rose bought out, they'll go to Johannesburg and start developing the mines. So the Transvaal government reluctantly has to allow them in. But you also need cheap labor force. The surface gold was relatively easy to extract, but buried gold deposits required machinery and led to development of large mining companies. And in 1887, they established the Chamber of Mines. Now, the Chamber of Mines was established because when this gold is discovered, these wealthy magnets, or these individuals with a lot of capital that can go in, develop the mines, extract the resources, or extract the gold and make the profits, need to maximize their profits. But there's certain things that they can't cut, costs, cut, can't cut costs on. The machinery that they have to import, they have to pay the money for that machinery, expensive machinery to build them these mines. Skilled, experienced miners from overseas who have experience in deep level mining, they demand high wages. Otherwise, they won't come to South Africa. So they have to pay them high. Where can this chamber of mine cut costs? with what it pays the lower paid workforce, particularly the African workers, because in the Transvaal, white workers who live there would have voting rights. So they can exercise that voting right on the government. The government's allowing these mining companies to come in. So the unskilled labor force is where they can cut costs on the most. So they make an agreement, the Chamber of Mines, where they will keep a minimum wage sorry, a maximum wage, not a minimum wage, a maximum wage to which they pay workers. Now, why is this the case? Like with the diamond mining industry, the diamond price is not fixed. So if too many people are mining diamonds, the, uh, it brings the price down, which is why roads monopolize the diamond mining industry. But with gold, the price of gold is fixed. They also can't control the price of gold. It's an in, in international price. Gold is used at this stage in history uh, most governments are, uh, base their currency on the gold standard. So for every amount of paper money that the government prints, it needs to have gold in its reserves to back that up. Hence, the price of gold is fixed. So this chamber of mines agree with each other that if they compete for labor, so for example, if two mining companies are trying to attract workers and one is willing to pay their workers more than the other, then the company that's paying their workers less is going to get less workers and hence they're going to have to pay and in this way workers wages is going to go up so they agree from the beginning that they will have a maximum wage that they pay workers so that they can keep it as low as possible so that they can keep their profits as high as possible and while various groups of africans have been conquered throughout south africa being forced to pay taxation the only way to pay taxation is to leave their homes tr tr go to the transvaal transvaal government will not allow them to settle in the region, so they'll be housed in compounds. Uh, this is something that was also used in Kimberley. Compounds allow, helps prevent theft, helps control the workforce, but it's also very dehumanizing for the people who live there. So lots of migrant African workers would leave their homes, go to the compounds, be housed in kind of like, think of it as being large prison camps where they would stay, be closely monitored. They would work alongside white workers who would go back home to their families, whereas they would be an all-male compound. Sense of racism, superiority also starts to develop at this point in time. And also the fact that in the Transvaal, white workers have voting power and African workers don't. A lot of uh, inequality starts emerging as a consequence of this mineral revolution as well, which will eventually culminate in the development of South Africa, when the anglo boer War does take place, so Second anglo boer War, the South African War, 1899 to 1902, a South Africa will be established where it would continue this practice of 
not allowing non-white people to vote, except with the exception of the one province, which would be the K province. Okay. Development of large companies. The money to create gold mines in Vatwatastrand came from profits of the diamonds discoveries in Kimberley. For example, Barney Bernato and J.B. Robertson were two leading businessmen in Kimberley who were the first to move to the Vatwatastrand. Later, Cecil John Rhodes, but he kind of was late to the game. Then the corner house, Werner Briet Eckstein. The region was transformed from a collection of tents into the largest city in sub-Saharan Africa. Again, consequence of the Min Revolution, what was once just farmland, Eventually, when gold is discovered, tents emerge, then it grows into the largest city in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, just a quick summary of why these mineral discoveries have been referred to as a mineral revolution. How did it revolutionize the region? What was its impact on the region? One, originally, this region, Southern Africa, was a collection of agrarian states. There was no foreign investments. Most areas were poor. But the mineral discoveries led to foreign investment and prosperity to certain areas. If you go back to South Africa in 1860, the Cape, Cape Town, that ports, a little bit of wealth, in the town there's a bit of coal mining at this stage, Dentured Indians are being used to grow sugar cane, but there's not a lot of wealth. Most areas are villages, most people are well, self-sufficient, but not a lot of wealth, or a lot of money. The principal means of trade is barter, but now, all of a sudden, there's going to be a lot of foreign investment and a lot of wealth coming into the region. Two, the change from an agrarian society to industrial economy. Most of the regions, you know, there was a little bit of export of wine at the Cape and wool and, you know, uh, coal mining and metal. But for the vast majority of people who lived in South Africa, whether they were white or whether they were uh, African or mixed race, they were farming societies or nomadic people. It was agrarian self-sufficient subsistence farmers. But now it's transforming into an industrial economy. Bartering had been the pre, uh, main means of trade, but after Mendel's discoveries, banks were established, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange came into being. Developments of mind led to the development of other infrastructure and economic activities. This included roads, railways, and bridges. Also had its impact not just in Johannesburg and Kimberley, which emerged as mining towns in what was once farmland, but ports get further developed, like Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, uh, Durban, because now there's a lot of people coming in, there's a lot of investment into the region, imports of machinery and goods, and hence these port cities develop further. Tr roads and railways are built to transport goods to the coast, and inland, um, so it also has huge implications on South Africa as a whole. Villages became cities, and two major cities, Johannesburg and Kimberley, emerged from nothing. The emergence of cities led to the development of economic activities associated with cities. Clothing, leather, soap, candles, food, liquor, etc. When people come in dense concentrations to these areas where there's potential for mining, then other industries develop alongside to supply the cities with what it requires. Growth of cities changed farming and led to improved techniques and emergence of commercial farms. South Africa had predominantly subsistence farm, but now lots of people are flocking into urban areas. Then farming becomes more mechanized, importation of uh, better tractors and stuff like that. And commercial agriculture starts to develop. Labor brought eight landers to the Boer Republics. Eventually, you know, the diamonds and gold discoveries will lead to the sequence of events which will culminate in the Second Anglo Boer War, the South African War, which will ultimately lead to South Africa as a state being established. So, to generalize, after diamonds are discovered, British go to war with various different groups. Gradually, more and more African societies lose their independence, become subordinate to the British Empire. Ultimately, the two Boer Republics will as well. And in 1910, you'll have the establishment of the country of South Africa. Labor also brought black workers to the mines. They were made to do unskilled labor in housing compounds. This facilitated this mineral discovery, this kind of South Africa's whole racial history and inequality. With the, with the mines and with maximizing profits and with individuals like Cecil John Rhodes who got involved in politics, this two past laws to force Africans to work in the mines, you eventually had a situation where African workers who worked in the mines get housed in compounds like prison camps, closely monitored, 
away from their families. They have to leave the area that they originated from because they have taxation, travel to the mines, work in compounds on fixed terms, be housed in all male worker compounds, be treated very badly, go to work alongside whites who in some instances are also doing similar jobs to them, right? The unskilled labor. But they go home to their families, they develop a sense of superiority. They also have voting power and hence they have the ability to demand higher wages. This also results in development of racism due to the ways in which black labor was treated and controlled. Okay, and this would pave the way for South Africa's whole kind of, South Africa, the country with the borders was established as a consequence of the events that these mineral discoveries had initiated. When it was established, it was established as a state which was made up of four provinces. And in those four provinces, only one province where non-whites were allowed to vote, that would be the Cape. But even in the Cape, it was property rights and wealth that determined voting, and generally whites had more money, so there would be more white voters. In the remaining three provinces, only whites would be allowed to vote. And then this would often be used to the advantagement of the government and the economy to use those who are, don't have voting power to provide cheap labor because they don't have voting power can get away with paying them as little as possible. And hence, South Africa would have a very cheap labor force that could be used to further attract foreign investment. In this video on the Mineral Revolution, I brushed over a lot of more complicated things uh, without the adequate detail, so to try to keep the video from becoming too long. But on this channel, there are some videos where I go into some of these things in more detail. I will make more videos as well where we look at specific events like the Anglo-Zulu War, for example, is a video here which goes into that in more detail. That is a consequence of the Mineral Revolution. I have a video on Rhodes, on Cecil John Rhodes. I will make one very soon on European settlement in South Africa. But hopefully if you have this, watch this video and you didn't really understand much about the Mineral Revolution, hopefully you have a better understanding and in this video description, there's a collection of readings and stuff that you can look at for more detail, more elaboration on some of the issues that I might have brushed over quite quickly to try and keep this video from me too long. Thank you.